believe this is the first English country house you've stayed at, Miss Worsley. Yes, Lady Caroline. You have no country houses, I'm told, in America. We have not many. Have you any country? What we should call country. We have the largest country in the world, Lady Caroline. Well, they used to tell us at school that some of our states are as big as France and England put together. Ah, you must find it very drafty, I should fancy. <laughs> John, you should have your muffler. What is the use of my always knitting mufflers for you if you won't wear them? I'm quite warm, Caroline, I assure you. I think not, John. Well, you couldn't come to a more charming place than this, Miss Worsley, though the house is excessively damp, quite unpardonably, uh, unpardonably damp, especially the bedrooms. Uh, and dear Lady Hunston is sometimes a little lax about the people she asks down here. Jane mixes too much. Lord Illingworth is, of course, a man of high distinction. It is a privilege to meet him. And that Member of Parliament, Mr. Kettle. Kevil, my love, Kevil. He must be quite respectable. One has never heard his name before in the whole course of one's life, and that speaks volumes for a man <laughs> nowadays. But Mrs. Allenby is hardly a very suitable person. I dislike Mrs. Allenby. I dislike her more than I can say. I am not sure, Miss Worsley, that foreigners like yourself should cultivate likes or dislikes about the people they are invited to meet. Mrs. Allenby is very well born. Uh -huh. She is the niece of Lord Brancaster. It is said, of course, that she ran away twice before she was married. But you know how unfair people often are. I myself don't believe she ran away more than once. Mr. Arbuthnot is very charming. Ah, yes. The young man who has a post in a bank. Lady Hunston is most kind in asking him here. And Lord Illingworth seems to have taken quite a fancy to him. I'm not sure, however, that Jane is right in taking him out of his position. In my young days, Miss Worsley, one never met anyone who worked for their living. <laughs> it was not considered the thing. In America, those are the people we respect most. I have no doubt of it. <laughs> Mr. Arbuthnot has a beautiful nature. He's so simple, so sincere, and so upright. It is a privilege to meet him. It is not customary in England, Miss Worsley, for a young lady to speak with such enthusiasm of any person of the opposite sex. <laughs> English women conceal their feelings till after they are married. They show them then. Do you allow no friendship to exist between a young man and a young girl? We think it very inadvisable. Jane, I was just saying what a pleasant party you have asked us to meet. You have a wonderful power of selection. It is quite a gift. Oh, dear Caroline, how kind of you. I think we all do fit in very nicely together. The cushion there, Francis. And my shawl, the Shetland. Get the Shetland. Lady Hunston, I have such good news to tell you. Lord Illingworth has just offered to make me his secretary. Oh, his <laughs> secretary? <gasps> that is good news indeed, Gerald. Why, it means a very brilliant future in store for you. Your dear mother will be delighted. I really must try and induce her to come up here tonight. Do you think she would, Gerald? I know how difficult it is to get her to go anywhere. Oh, I am sure she would, Lady Hunston, if she knew Lord Illingworth had made me such an offer. Well, I will write and tell her about it and ask her to come up and meet him. Just wait, Francis. This is a very wonderful opening for so young a man as you are, Mr. Arbuthnot. It is indeed, Lady Caroline. I trust I shall be able to show myself worthy of it. I trust so. You have not congratulated me yet, Miss Worsley. Are you very pleased about it? Of course I am. Things that were out of the reach of hope before may be within hope's reach now. Nothing should be out of the reach of hope. Life is a hope. John, muffler, this September air is chilly. I'm quite warm, Caroline. I think not. I fancy, Caroline, that diplomacy is what Lord Illingworth is aiming at. I heard it was offered Vienna. I don't think England should be represented abroad by an unmarried man, Jane. 
It might lead to complications. Oh, you are too nervous, Caroline. Believe me, too nervous. Besides, Lord Illingworth may marry any day. I was in hopes he would have married Lady Kelso, but I believe he said her family was too large. Or was it her feet? I forget which. <laughs> Tell Henry to wait for an answer. I've written a line to your dear mother, Gerald, to tell her your good news and to say she must come to dinner. That is kind of you, Lady Hunston. Will you come for a stroll, Miss Worsley? With pleasure. <laughs> I'm much gratified at Gerald Arbuthnot's good fortune. He's quite a protégé of mine. John, the grass is too damp for you. You'd better go and put on your overshoes at once. I'm quite comfortable, Caroline, I assure you. You must allow me to be the best judge of that, John. <laughs> Pray do as I tell you. Very well, dear. <laughs> you spoil him, Caroline, you do indeed. <laughs> well, dear, I hope you like the park. It is said to be well timbered. Oh, the trees are wonderful, Lady Hunston. Oh, quite, quite wonderful. But I think that's the drawback of the country. There are so many trees, one can't see the temptations. <laughs> <laughs> I feel sure if I lived in the country for six months, no one would take the slightest notice of me. Oh, I can assure you, dear, the country has not that effect at all. Why, it was from Melthorpe, which is only two miles from here, that Lady Belton eloped with Lord Feathersdale. I remember the occurrence perfectly. <laughs> Poor Lord Belton died three days afterwards of joy. <laughs> <laughs> or gout, I forget which. <laughs> oh, to elope is cowardly. It's running away from danger. And danger has become so rare in modern life. We all live in the most vulgar security. As far as I can make out, the young women of the present day make it the sole object of their lives to be always playing with fire. The one advantage of playing with fire, Lady Caroline, is that one never gets even singed. It's the people who don't know how to play with it who get burned up. Yes, I see that. It is very, very helpful. <laughs> I'm afraid, dear, you like making fools of men. That is never necessary. <laughs> <laughs> the world was made for men and not for women. Oh, don't say that, Lady Stutfield. We have a much better time than them. There are far more things forbidden to us than are forbidden to them. That is quite, quite true. I had not thought of that. <laughs> Your last remark, Mrs. Allenby, sounds rather like tempting Providence. Oh, surely Providence can resist temptation by this time, Lady Caroline. <laughs> well, Mr. Kevill, have you got through your work? I have finished my writing for the day, Lady Hunston. It has been an arduous task. The demands on the time of a public man are very heavy nowadays, very heavy indeed. And I don't think they meet with adequate recognition. John, have you got your overshoes on? Yes, my love. You should have brought your muffler too. Well, dear, I... I think you had better come and sit over here, John. It is more sheltered. I am quite comfortable, Caroline. I think not, John. You had better sit beside me. And what have you been writing about this afternoon, Mr. Kevill? On the usual subject, Lady Stutfield. On purity. Oh, that must be such a very, very interesting thing to write about. It is the one subject of really national importance nowadays, Lady Stutfield. I purpose addressing my constituents on the question before Parliament meets. I find that the poorer classes of this country display a marked desire for a higher ethical standard among the upper classes. How quite, quite nice of them. Are you in favour of women taking part in politics, Mr. Kettle? Kevil, my love, Kevil. The growing influence of women is the one reassuring thing in our political life, Lady Caroline. Women are always on the side of morality, public and private. It is so very, very gratifying to hear you say that. Ah, oh, yes. The moral qualities in women, that is the important thing. I'm afraid, Caroline, that dear Lord Illingworth doesn't value the moral qualities in women as much as he should. The world says that Lord Illingworth is very, very wicked. But what world says that, Lady Stutfield? Must be the next world. This world and I are on excellent terms. Everyone I know says you are very, very wicked. It is perfectly monstrous the way people go about nowadays saying things against one behind one's back that are absolutely and entirely true. 
<laughs> Dear Lord Illingworth, it's quite hopeless, Lady Studfield. I have given up trying to reform him. It would take a, a public company and a board of directors and a, a paid secretary to do that. <laughs> but you have the secretary already, haven't you, Lord oh. Illingworth? Gerald Arbuthnot has told us his good news. It really is most kind of you. Oh, don't say that, Lady Hunson. Kind is a dreadful word. He will be excessively useful. I never answer my letters, and as I get an unbearable amount every morning, I want someone to help me, not to answer them. <laughs> oh, he's an admirable young man, and his mother is one of my dearest friends. Oh. He's just gone for a walk with our pretty American. She is very pretty, is she not? Mm. Far too pretty. These American girls carry off all the good matches. Who are Miss Worsley's parents? Oh, Miss Worsley is an orphan, Caroline. Her father was a very wealthy millionaire or philanthropist, or both, I believe, who entertained my son, James, quite hospitably when he visited Boston. I don't know how he made his money originally. I fancy in American dry goods. I remember the name in connection with the question of tariff duties. Well, what are American dry goods? American novels. <laughs> well, from whatever source her large fortune came, I have a great esteem for Miss Worsley. I am afraid you don't appreciate America, Lord Illingworth. It is a very remarkable country, especially considering its youth. The youth of America is its oldest tradition. It's been going on now for 300 years. <laughs> to hear them talk, one would think they're in their first childhood. <laughs> there is undoubtedly a great deal of corruption in American politics. I suppose you allude to that. I wonder. Do you take no side, then, in modern politics, Lord Illingworth? One should never take sides in anything, Mr. Kevill. Taking sides is the beginning of sincerity, and earnestness follows shortly afterwards. No educated person is interested in politics. I wonder what Mr. Kettle says of that. Kevill, dear, Kevill. I consider the House of Commons to be our most admirable institution. I have nothing to say against the House of Commons. It is the last bulwark of our national stupidity. You cannot deny that the House has shown great sympathy with the sufferings of the poor. That is its special vice. That is the special vice of the age. One should sympathize with the joy, the beauty, the color of life. The less said about life's sores, the better, Mr. Kevill. Still, our East End is a very important problem. Quite so. It is the problem of slavery. And we are trying to solve it by amusing the slaves. Dear Dr. Daubney, our rector, here provides, with the assistance of his curates, really admirable recreations for the poor during the winter. And much good may be done by means of a magic lantern or a missionary or some popular amusement of that kind. I'm not at all in favor of amusements for the poor, Jane. Blankets and coals are sufficient. There is too much love of pleasure amongst the upper classes as it is. Health is what we want in modern life. You are quite right, Lady Caroline. I believe I am usually right, Mr. Kettle. <laughs> Kevil, my own one, Kevil. Horrid word, health. Silliest word in our language. And one knows so well the popular idea of health. The English country gentleman galloping after a fox. The unspeakable in full pursuit of the uneatable. <laughs> are you going, Mrs. Allenby? Just as far as the conservatory, Lady Hanston. Lord Illingworth told me this morning that there is an orchid in there as beautiful as the seven deadly sins. Oh, my dear, I hope there's nothing of the kind. I will certainly speak to the gardener. <laughs> Remarkable type, Mrs. Allenby. Mm. She lets her clever tongue run away with her sometimes. Is that the only thing Jane, Mrs. Allenby, allows to run away with her? I hope so, Caroline, I'm sure. You... Oh, dear Lord Alfred, do join us. You believe good of everyone, Jane. It is a great fault. Do you really, really think, Lady Caroline, that one should believe evil of everyone? I think it is much safer to do so, Lady Stutfield, until, of course, people are found out to be good. But there is so much unkind scandal in modern life. Lord Illingworth remarked to me last night at dinner that the basis of every scandal is an absolutely 
immoral certainty. <laughs> Lord Illingworth is, of course, a very brilliant man. But he seems to me to be lacking in that fine faith in the purity of life, which is so important in this century. Yes, quite, quite important, is it not? I have heard him speak with much levity about the marriage tie. Well, that seems very, very wrong, does it not? I fear Lord Illingworth regards woman simply as a toy. Now, I have never regarded woman as a toy without... Woman, we should forget the true ideals. It is so very, very gratifying to hear you say that. <laughs> you a married man, Mr. Kettle? Kevil, dear, Kevil. I am married, Lady Caroline. Family? Yes. How many? Eight. Mrs. Kettle and oh. the children are, I suppose, at the seaside. My wife is at the seaside with the children, Lady Caroline. You will join them later on, no doubt. If my public engagements permit me. <laughs> Your public life must be a great source of gratification to Mrs. Kettle. <coughs> Kevil, my love. John, Kevil. John, John, you're getting fever. I can see it. I can see it. <laughs> How very, very charming those gold-tipped cigarettes of yours are, Lord Alfred. They are awfully expensive. I can only afford them when I'm in debt. It must be terribly, terribly distressing to be in debt. One must have some occupation nowadays. If I hadn't my debts, I shouldn't have anything to think about. All the chaps I know are in debt. I'm afraid you are sadly, sadly <clears throat> extravagant, Lord Alfred. I think... If one can get a thing for 10 shillings, it's absurd not to pay 15 for it. <laughs> but don't the people to whom you owe the money give you a great, great deal of annoyance? Oh, no. They write, I don't. <laughs> How very, very strange. Oh, here is a letter, Caroline, from dear Mrs. Arbuthnot. Oh, she will not die, and I'm so sorry. But she will come in the evening. Oh, I'm very pleased indeed. She's one of the sweetest women. Writes a beautiful hand, too. So large, so firm. A little lacking in femininity, Jane. Femininity is a quality I admire most in women. Oh, she's very feminine, Caroline, and so good, too. You should hear what the Archdeacon says of her. He regards her as his right hand in the parish. In the yellow drawing room. Oh, shall we all go in? Fresh tea in the drawing room. Oh, Lady Stutfield. With pleasure, Lady Hunston. <coughs> John, if you would allow your nephew to look after Lady Stutfield's things, you might help me with my work basket. Certainly, my love. I should have thought Lady Caroline would have tired of conjugal anxiety by this time. Sir John is her fourth. So much marriage is certainly not becoming. Twenty years of romance make a woman look like a ruin, but twenty years of marriage make her something like a public building. <laughs> twenty years of romance? Is there such a thing? Not in our day. Women have become too brilliant. Yes, and the men too tedious. Nothing spoils a romance so much as a sense of humour in a woman. Or the want of it in the man. You are quite right. In a temple, everyone should be serious, except the thing being worshipped. And that should be man? Women kneel so gracefully. Men don't. You're thinking of Lady Stutfield. I assure you, I have not thought of Lady Stutfield for the last quarter of an hour. <laughs> Is she such a mystery? She's more than a mystery. She's a mood. Oh, moods don't last. It is their chief charm. Lord Illingworth. Everyone has been congratulating me. Lady Hunston and Lady Caroline and... Everyone. I hope I shall make a good secretary. Gerald, you will be the pattern secretary. You enjoy country life, Miss Worsley? Very much indeed. You don't find yourself longing for a London dinner party? I dislike London dinner parties. Oh. Well, I adore them. The clever people never listen and the stupid people never talk. I find the stupid people talk a great deal. Oh. Well, I never listen. 
My dear boy, if I didn't like you, I wouldn't have made you the offer. It's because I like you so much that I want to have you with me. Don't you think I made a wise choice of secretary, Miss Worsley? I think you have. Charming fellow. Very nice. Very nice indeed. But I can't stand the American young lady. Why? She told me yesterday, and in quite a loud voice too, that she was only 18. It was really most annoying. <laughs> one should never trust a woman who tells one her real age. <laughs> a woman who would tell you that would tell you anything. <laughs> and she is a Puritan besides. Oh, that is inexcusable. <laughs> but she is decidedly pretty. What a thoroughly bad man you must be. What do you call a bad man? Oh, the sort of man who admires innocence. And a bad woman? Oh, the sort of woman a man never tires of. You are severe on yourself. Hmm. Define us as a sex. Sphinxes without secrets. <laughs> and men? Oracles without wisdom. <laughs> Sphinxes. Mm. Does that include the Puritan women? Do you know, I don't believe in the existence of Puritan women. I don't think there is a woman in the world who would not be a little flattered to be made love to. You do not think there is a woman in the world who'd object to being kissed? Very few. Well, Miss Worsley would not let you kiss her. Are you sure? Quite. I am not. I am. What do you think she'd do if I kissed her? Either marry you or strike you across the face with her glove. What would you do if she struck you across the face with her glove? Fall in love with her, probably. <laughs> then it's lucky you're not going to kiss her. Is that a challenge? It is an arrow shot into the air. Don't you know that I always succeed in everything I try? Oh, I'm sorry to hear it. We women adore failures. They lean on us. How tantalising you are. Oh, Lord Illingworth, there is one thing I shall always like you for. Only one thing, and I have so many bad qualities. <sighs> Don't grow too conceited about them. You may lose them as you grow old. Oh, I never intend to grow old. The soul is born old and grows young. That is the comedy of life. Yes, and the body is born young and grows old. That is life's tragedy. <laughs> it's comedy too, sometimes. But what is the mysterious reason why you will always like me? It is that you have never made love to me. I thought I had. Never. Are you quite sure? You have to ask. We're good friends still. You are quite right. I have never made love to you. I wonder why. I think our timetables did not correspond. <laughs> it is fortunate. It would have been a collision. A catastrophe for both of us. Well, we should each have survived. Oh, one can survive anything nowadays, except death, <laughs> and live down everything except a good reputation. Have you tried a good reputation? It is one of the many annoyances to which I have not been subjected. <laughs> it may come. Why do you threaten me? I will tell you when you've kissed the Puritan. Oh, it'll be this week then. I think not. You annoy me horribly by saying so. <laughs> I see that I do. Fresh tea is served in the yellow drawing room, my lord. Tell her ladyship we are coming in. Yes, my lord. Shall we go into tea? Do you like such simple pleasures? Oh, I adore simple pleasures. They are the last refuge of the complex. But, if you wish, let us stay here. Yes, let us stay here. The book of life begins with a man and a woman in a garden. It ends with revelations. You fence divinely, but the button has come off your foil. Oh, I still have the mask. It makes your eyes lovelier. Thank you. Come. Curious handwriting. It reminds me of the handwriting of a woman I used to know years ago. Who? Oh, no one. No one in particular. A woman of no importance. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and now for a little after-dinner entertainment, supported by myself, with Tilly on clarinet, Francis, 
our very special guest, Lady Stutfield, on violin, and with a song whose sentiment will never tire, the fabled chanteurs of the home counties, Lady Hunston. On our way, the toilsome road of life. How few the friends that daily there we meet. Not many will stand by in trouble or in strife, with counsel and affection never sweet. But there is one who smile will ever on us be. Love is dearer far than any other. And wherever we may turn, this lesson we will learn. A boy's best friend is his mother. <laughs> then cherish her with care and smooth her silvery hair. When gone, you will never get another. Then cheer her with your kindness and your love. And your love. Remember at her knee, in childhood bright and dear, we heard her voice like angels from above. From above. Though after years may bring their kindness and their woe, her love is sweeter far than any Cherish her with care and smooth her silvery hair. When gone, you will never get another. Thank you. Thank you, most kind. Now, if the gentlemen would follow me to the billiards room for port, the ladies may withdraw for coffee in the drawing room. What a comfort it is to have got rid of the men for a little. Yes, men persecute us dreadfully, don't they? Persecute us? Oh, I wish they did. <laughs> Oh, my dear. The annoying thing is that the wretches can do perfectly well without us. That is why I think it is every woman's duty never to leave them alone for a single moment. Except for this short breathing space after dinner, without which I believe we poor women would be absolutely worn to shadows. Worn to shadows, dear? Yes, Lady Hunston. It's such a strain giving men up to the mark. They're always trying to escape from us. Men are so very, very heartless. They know their power and use it. Oh, what stuff and nonsense all this about men is. The thing is to keep men in their proper place. And what is their proper place, Lady Caroline? Looking after their wives, Mrs Allenby. <laughs> really? And if they're not married? If they're not married, they should be looking after a wife. 
It's perfectly scandalous. The amount of bachelors who are going about society, there should be a law passed to compel them all to marry within 12 months. <laughs> I sh shall speak to that Mr. Kettle on the subject. <laughs> but if they're in love with someone who perhaps is tied to another. In that case, Lady Stubfield, they should be married off in a week to some plain, respectable girl in order to teach them not to meddle with other people's property. <laughs> I don't think we should ever be spoken of as other people's property. All men are married women's property. We don't belong to anyone. Oh, I'm so very, very glad to hear you say so. Well, I suppose the type of husband has changed completely since my young day, but I'm bound to state that poor dear Hunston was the most delightful of creatures and as good as gold. Oh, well, my husband is a sort of promissory note. I'm tired of meeting him. <laughs> but you, you renew him from time to time, don't you? Oh, no, Lady Caroline. I've only ever had one husband as yet. I suppose you look upon me as quite an amateur. With your views on life, I wonder you married at all. Oh, so do I. <laughs> my dear child, I believe you are really very happy in your married life. But you like to hide your happiness from others. I assure you, I was horribly deceived in earnest. Have you never forgiven him, then? How sad that seems. But then all life is very, very sad, is it not? Oh. <laughs> life, Lady Stutfield, is simply a movie cadre made up of exquisite moments. Yes, there are moments, certainly. But was it something very, very wrong that Mr. Allenby did? Uh, did he become angry with you or, or say anything that was unkind or true? <laughs> oh, dear, no. Ernest is invariably calm. Mm. That is one of the reasons he always gets on my nerves. Nothing is so aggravating as calmness. <laughs> it certainly would be a good thing if modern husbands lost their tempers a little more often. Mm. They are too easygoing, no spirit. I would so much like to know what was the wrong thing that Mr. Allenby did. Well... I will tell you, if you solemnly promise to tell everybody else. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. I, I will make a point of repeating it. But when Ernest and I were engaged, he swore to me on his knees that he had never loved anyone before in the whole course of his life. I was very young at the time, so I didn't believe him, I needn't tell you. Unfortunately, however, I made no inquiries of any kind until after I'd actually been married four or five months. I'd be so occupied with my frocks, I'd forgotten all about it, I suppose. And when you made careful inquiries, you found that, that it was perfectly true. Oh. And that sort of thing makes a man so absolutely uninteresting. Oh, oh my dear. Oh. Men always want to be a woman's first love. That is their clumsy vanity. We women have a more subtle instinct. What we like is to be a man's last romance. My dear child, you don't mean to tell me you won't forgive your husband because he never loved anyone else. Did you ever hear such a thing, Caroline? I'm quite surprised. Uh, women have become so highly educated, Jane, that nothing should surprise us nowadays except happy marriages. They apparently are getting remarkably rare. Marriages, Lady Caroline, are ruined nowadays more by the common sense of the husband than anything else. But how can a woman be expected to be happy with a man who insists on treating her as if she were a perfectly rational being? Oh, my dear. Look, man, poor, awkward, reliable, necessary man, belongs to a sex that has been rational for millions and millions of years. He can't help himself. It's in his race. The caveman began it in order to annoy his wife, I've no doubt. <laughs> the history of woman is very different. We have always been picturesque protests against the mere existence of common sense. We saw its dangers from the first. Yes, the common sense of husbands is certainly most, most trying. But uh, do tell me your conception of the ideal husband. I think it would be so very, very helpful. The ideal husband? There couldn't be such a thing. The institution is wrong. Well, the ideal man, then. Tell us about him. He would probably be extremely realistic. The ideal man. Oh, well, the ideal man should talk to us as if we were goddesses and treat us as if we were children. 
We should deny all our serious requests and gratify every one of our whims. He should encourage us to have caprices and forbid us to have missions. And he should always say much more than he means and always mean much more than he says. As far as I can see, he is to do nothing but pay bills and compliments. <laughs> <laughs> he should persistently compromise us in public, yet treat us with absolute respect when we're alone. And yet, he should always be ready to have a perfectly terrible scene whenever we want one. And to become miserable, absolutely miserable, at a moment's notice. And to overwhelm us with just reproaches in less than 20 minutes. And to become positively violent at the end of half an hour. And to leave us forever at a quarter to eight, when we have to go and dress for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> and after that, when one has left him for really the last time and he has refused to take back all the little things he has given one and promised never to communicate with one again or write one any foolish letters, he should be perfectly broken-hearted and telegraph to one all day long and send one little notes every half hour by private handsome and dine quite alone at the club so that everyone should know how unhappy he was. And then, after a whole dreadful week, during which one has gone about everywhere with one's husband, just to show how absolutely lonely one was, he may be given a third last parting in the evening. And if his conduct has been quite irreproachable, and one has behaved really badly towards him, <laughs> he should be allowed to admit that he has been entirely in the wrong. <laughs> and once he has admitted that, and grown sad and pale and tired under the eyes, it becomes a woman's duty to forgive. <laughs> <laughs> and one could do it all over again, from the beginning, <laughs> with variations. <laughs> <laughs> How clever you are, my dear. <laughs> You don't mean a single word you say. <laughs> Thank you. It has been quite, quite entrancing. I must try and remember it all. There are such a number of details that are so very, very important. <laughs> but you, you have not told us yet what the reward of the ideal man is to be. His reward? Mm -hmm. Ah. Infinite expectation. That's <laughs> quite enough for him. <laughs> yes, I see that. <laughs> Do you think, Mrs. Allenby, I shall ever meet the ideal man? Or are there more than one? There are just four in London, Lady Stutfield. Oh, <laughs> oh my dear. What has happened? Do tell me. I had completely forgotten the American young lady has been in the room all the time. I'm afraid some of this clever talk may have shocked her a little. Oh, that will do her so much good. Let us hope she didn't understand much. I think I'd better go and talk to her. <laughs> <laughs> My dear Miss Worsley. Are you there, Miss Worsley? Yes, Lady Caroline. <laughs> How quiet you have been in your nice little corner all this time. I suppose you've been reading a book. No, I have been listening to the conversation. <laughs> you mustn't believe everything that was said, you know, dear. Well, I didn't believe any of it. <laughs> that is quite right, dear. Well, I couldn't believe any women could really hold such views of life as I've heard tonight from some of your guests. I believe you have such pleasant society in America, but it's quite like our own in places. My son James wrote to me. There are cliques in America, as elsewhere, Lady Hunston, and money is thought far too much of there, as it is here. We also have foolish people who pride themselves on the accident of family and birth, but, but they are of no importance to us. A true American society consists simply of all the good women and all the good men we have in our country. What a very sensible system. And quite pleasant too, I dare say. <laughs> I'm afraid in England we have too many artificial social barriers. We don't see as much as we should of the middle and lower classes. In America we have no lower classes. Really? 
What a very strange arrangement. <laughs> what is that dreadful girl talking about? Oh, she's painfully natural, is she not? There are a great many things you haven't got, I'm told, in America, Miss Worsley. They say you have no ruins, <laughs> no curiosities. The English aristocracy supply us with our curiosities, Lady Caroline. <laughs> they are sent over to us every summer regularly in the steamers and propose to us the day after they land. <laughs> As for ruins, we are trying to build up something that will last longer than brick or stone. And what is that, dear? Oh, the iron exhibition, is it not? At that place with a curious name. We are trying to build up life, Lady Hunston, on a better, truer, purer basis than life rests on here to construct society on other foundations than those of selfishness and sin. For it is sin that allows others to starve that it may surfeit, and lives in idleness itself on the work of weak hands and the toil of wretched days. This sounds strange to you all, no doubt. How can it sound other than strange? Are you Rich people in England, you don't know how you were living. How could you know? You shut out from your society the gentle and the good. You laugh at the simple and the pure. Living as you all do on others and by them, you sneer at self-sacrifice. And if you throw bread to the poor, it is merely to keep them quiet for a season. You cultivated people in England, you don't know why you're living. Uh, what does your wealth bring you but weariness? Uh, what do your pleasures bring you but ennui and pain? Uh, with all your pomp and wealth and art, you don't know how to live. You don't even know that. You love the beauty that you can see and touch and handle, the beauty that you can destroy and do destroy but of the unseen beauty of life, the unseen beauty of a higher life, you know nothing. You have lost life's secret. Your English society seems to me shallow, selfish, foolish. It has blinded its eyes and stopped its ears. It lies like a, a leper in purple. It sits like a dead thing, smeared with gold. It is all wrong, all wrong. I don't think one should know of these things. It's not very, very nice, is it? <laughs> My dear Miss Worsley, I thought you liked English society so much. You were such a success in it, admired by the best people. I quite forget what Lord Henry Weston said of you, but it was most Lord Henry Weston, I remember him, Lady Hunston. A man who, I am told, has brought many women to misery and to shame. Oh, he's asked everywhere. No dinner party is complete without him. What of the women whose ruin is due to him? They are outcasts. They are nameless. I, I don't complain of their punishment. Let all women who have sinned be punished. My dear young lady. It is right that they should be punished. But don't let them be the only ones to suffer. If a man and woman have sinned, let them both go forth into the desert to love or loathe each other there. Let them both be branded. Don't have one law for men and another for women until you count what is a shame in a woman to be an infamy in a man you will always be unjust and right that the pillar of fire and wrong that pillar of cloud will be made dim to your eyes oh might i dear miss worsley as you're standing up ask you for my thread which is just behind you <laughs> oh my dear mrs arbuthnot i'm so pleased you have come up, but I didn't hear you announce. Oh, I came straight in from the terrace, Lady Hunston, <laughs> just as I was. Oh! Uh, you didn't tell me you were having a party. Oh, it's not a party. It's just a few guests 
who is staying in the house and whom you must know. Allow me. Caroline, this is Mrs. Arbuthnot, one of my sweetest friends, Lady Caroline Pomfrey. How do you do? Lady Stuffield, Mrs. Allenby, and this is my young American friend, Miss Worsley, who's just been telling us all how wicked we are. <laughs> I'm afraid you think I spoke too strongly, Lady Hunston, but... But there are some things in England. Oh, my dear young lady, there was a great deal of truth, I dare say, in what you said. And you looked very pretty when you said it, and that's much more important. Mm. The only point where I thought you were a little hard was about poor C Lady Caroline's brother, poor Lord Henry. He really is such good company. Take Mrs. Arbuthnot's things. L Lady Caroline, I had no idea it was your brother. I'm sorry for the pain oh, it must have caused Miss you. Worsley, the only part of your little speech, if I may so term it, with which I thoroughly agreed was the part about my brother. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing you could possibly say could be too bad for him. I regard Henry as infamous, absolutely infamous. But I am bound to state that, as you were remarking, Jane, he is excellent company, and he is one of the best cooks in London. And after a good dinner, one can forgive anybody, even one's own relations. <laughs> <laughs> now, do come, dear, and make friends with Mrs. Arbuthnot. Now, she is one of the good, sweet, simple people that you told us we never admitted into society. <laughs> what a bore it is, the men staying so long after dinner. I expect they're saying the most dreadful things about us. Oh, do you really think so? I was sure of it. Oh, how very, very horrid of them. Oh, I wish to goodness they would come. Oh, shall we go out onto the terrace? Oh, anything to get away from the dowagers and the dowdies. <laughs> We're going to look at the stars, Lady Hunston. Oh, you will find a great many, dear. A great many. <laughs> Don't catch cold. Miss Worsley and Gerald our fast friends, Mrs. Arbuthnot. Uh, your son has been very kind to me during my stay here. Yes, he's spoken to me about you several times. He's so pleased to have had the honour of meeting you. Oh, we're all going to miss Gerald so much, dear Mrs. Arbuthnot. Has Lord Inuas really offered to make Gerald his secretary? Oh, yes, and he's been most charming about it. He has the highest possible opinion of your boy. You don't know Lord Illingworth, I believe, dear. No, I've never met him. But you know of him by name, no doubt. No, I'm afraid I don't. I live so much out of the world and see so few people. I remember hearing about an old Lord Illingworth who lived in Yorkshire, I think. Oh, oh. oh. <laughs> that would be the last Earl but one. He was a very curious man. <laughs> Wanted to marry beneath him, or wouldn't, I believe. No, there was some scandal about it. The present Lord Illingworth is quite different. He's very distinguished, and, and he is comparatively a young man still. And only came to his title within... Um, how long exactly is it, Caroline, since uh, Lord Illingworth succeeded? About four years, I think, Jane. I know it was the same year my brother had his last exposure in the evening newspapers. Oh, yes, I remember. <laughs> yes, that would be about four years. Of course, there were a great many people between the present Lord Illingworth and the title, Mrs. Arbuthnot. There was some... No, who was there, Caroline? There was poor Margaret's baby. You remember how anxious she was to have a boy, and it was a boy, but it died. And her husband died shortly afterwards, and she married almost immediately one of Ascot's sons, who, I'm told, beats her. Oh, that's in the family, dear. Mm. That's in the family. Mm. And there was also, I remember, a clergyman who wanted to be a lunatic, or a lunatic who wanted to be a clergyman, <laughs> But I know the Court of Chancery investigated the matter and decided he was quite sane. And I saw him afterwards at poor Lord Plumstead with straws in his hair. There was something very odd about him. I can't recall what. <laughs> oh, I often regret, Caroline, that dear Lady Cecilia never lived to see her son get the title. Lady Cecilia? Lord Ellingworth's mother, dear Mrs Arbuthnot. She married Sir Thomas Harford, 
who wasn't considered a very good match for her at the time. I knew them all quite intimately, and both the sons, Arthur and George. It, it was the eldest son who succeeded, of course, Lady Hunston. <laughs> no, dear. He was killed in the hunting field. Yeah. Or was it fishing, Caroline? Mm, yeah, I forget. Yeah. Yeah. And George came in for everything. I always tell him, no younger son has ever had such good luck <laughs> as he has had. Lady Hanson, I'd like to speak to Gerald at once. Might I see him? Could he be sent for? Oh, certainly, dear. I will send one of the servants into the dining room to fetch him. I don't know what keeps the gentleman so long. I hope Sir John has not been drinking port. It is excessively bad for him. I don't think it'll do him any harm, Caroline. Sir John is very delicate. He requires to be carefully watched. You spoil him, Caroline. You do indeed. When I first knew Lord Illingworth as playing George Harford, he was simply a very brilliant young man about town, with not a penny of money except what poor dear Lady Cecilia gave to him. She was devoted to him, chiefly, I fancy, because he was on bad terms with his father. <laughs> Here is the dear Archdeacon. No, it doesn't. <laughs> has been most oh, entertaining. Really I've never enjoyed myself more. <laughs> Mrs. Arbuthnot. You see, I have got Mrs. Arbuthnot to come to me at last. That is a great honor, Lady Hunston. <laughs> Mrs. Daubeny will be quite jealous of you. Oh, I'm so sorry Mrs. Daubeny could not come with you tonight. Uh, uh, Headache as usual, I suppose. Yes, Lady Hunston, a perfect martyr. But she's happiest alone. <laughs> she's happiest alone. John? Yes, my love. How is the most charming woman in the world? Oh, we are both quite well, thank you, Lord Illingworth. But what a short time you've been in the dining room. It seems as if we'd only just left. You might have waited for another cigarette. I was bored to death. Never opened my lips the whole time. Absolutely longing to come into you. Oh, you should have. The American girl has been giving us a lecture. Really? All Americans lecture, I believe. Must be the climate. What was she lecturing about? Oh, Puritanism, of course. I am going to convert her, am I not? How long do you give me? A week. A week is more than enough. I don't think so. Dear mother. <laughs> Gerald. I, I don't feel at all well, Gerald. See me home. I shouldn't have come. I'm so sorry, Mother, certainly. But you must know Lord Illingworth first. No, not tonight, Gerald. Oh, do speak to him for a moment. This is so important to me. Lord Illingworth, I want you so much to know my mother. With the greatest pleasure. Be back in a moment. People's mothers always bore me to death. <laughs> all women become like their mothers. That is their tragedy. No man does. That is his. What a delightful mood you're in this evening. Mother, this is Lord Illingworth who has offered to take me as his private secretary. It is a wonderful opening for me, isn't it? I hope he won't be disappointed in me, that is all. You'll thank Lord Illingworth, Mother, won't you? Lord Illingworth is very good, I'm sure, to interest himself in you for the moment. Oh, Gerald and I are great friends already, Mrs. Arbuthnot. There can be nothing in common between you and my son, Lord Illingworth. Dear Mother, how can you say so? Of course, Lord Illingworth is awfully clever and that sort of thing. There is nothing Lord Illingworth doesn't know. My dear boy. He knows more about life than anyone I have ever met. He's been awfully good to me, Mother. No one has ever been so good. Lord Illingworth may change his mind. He may not really want you as his secretary. Mother, why do you say that? But you must remember you've had so few advantages. Lord Illingworth, I need to speak to you. Do come over. <laughs> Will you excuse me, Mrs Arbuthnot? <gasps> now, Gerald, don't let your charming mother make any more difficulties. The thing is quite settled. Isn't it? I hope so. What is the attraction saints always have for sinners? I thought you'd never leave the lady in black velvet. She is excessively handsome. Caroline, shall we make a move to the music room? Miss Worsley is going to play. Cock a doodle doo. <laughs> oh, you'll come too, won't you, dear Mrs. Arbuthnot? Oh, I really must take Miss Worsley down some afternoon to the rectory. Oh. I should so like Mrs. Daubney to hear her on the violin. Oh, I forgot. Mrs. Daubney's hearing is a little defective, is it not? Her deafness is a great privation to her. She can't even hear my sermons now. She reads them at home, but she has many resources in herself. Many resources. She reads a great deal, I suppose. Just the very largest print. 
The eyesight is rapidly going, but she's never morbid, never morbid. <laughs> Do speak to my mother, Lord Illingworth, before you go into the music room. She seems to think somehow you don't mean what you said to me. Aren't you coming? In a few moments. Lady Hunston, if Mrs Arbuthnot will allow me, I would like to say a few words to her and we will join you later on. Oh, yes, of course. You will have a great deal to say to her. And she will have a great deal to thank you for. It is not every son that gets such an offer, Mrs Arbuthnot, but I know you appreciate that, dear. John! Yes, my love. Now, don't keep Mrs Arbuthnot too long, Lord Illingworth. We can't spare her. And don't say any of your clever things to her. She doesn't know any of the wickedness of the world. So that is our son, Rachel. Well, I'm very proud of him. He is a Harford, every inch of him. By the way, why are both not, Rachel? One name is as good as another, when one has no right to any name. I suppose so. But why Gerald? After a man whose heart I broke, after my father. And why Rockley? Well, I had hopes that in a little English village I would not meet anyone who'd ever known me. Well, Rachel, what is over is over. I'm very, very pleased with our son. It's a curious thing, Rachel. My life seemed to be quite complete. It was not so. It lacked something. It lacked a son. I have found my son now. I'm glad I found him. You have no right to claim him or the smallest part of him. The boy's entirely mine and shall remain mine. My dear Rachel, you have had him to yourself for over 20 years. Why not let me have him a little now? He is quite as much mine as yours. You, you, you're talking of the child you abandoned. The child who, as far as you're concerned, might have died of hunger and of want. You forget, Rachel, it was you who left me. It was not I who left you. I left you because you refused to give the child a name. Before my son was born, I implored you to marry me. You refused. That was my mother's doing, Rachel. She said it would be perfect madness. I had no expectations, and besides, I wasn't much older than you were. I was only 22. I was 21, I believe, when the whole thing began in your father's garden. Well, when a man is old enough to do wrong, he should be old enough to do right also. My dear Rachel, to say I left our child to starve is untrue and silly. My mother offered you 600 a year, but you wouldn't take anything. You simply disappeared oh. and carried the child away with I you. I wouldn't have accepted a penny from her. Your father was different. He told you in my presence when we were in Paris it was your duty to marry me. Oh, duty is what one expects from others. It is not what one does oneself. Your father was an English gentleman. Yes, and my mother was an English lady. I was influenced by her. Every man is when he is young. I'm glad to hear you say so. Gerald shall certainly not go away with you. Oh, what nonsense, Rachel. Do you think I would allow my son? Our son. My son. To go away with the man who ruined my life. You don't realise what my past has been in suffering and in shame. My dear Rachel, I think Gerald's future considerably more important than your past. Gerald cannot separate his future from my past. But that is exactly what he should do. Don't <coughs> let us have a scene. Rachel, I want you to look at this matter from the common sense point of view. What is our son at present? What is his occupation? sitting behind a ledger in a small provincial bank from 10 till 4. What are his pleasures? A tea party at the rectory once a month, cricket on a Sunday afternoon, dinner with the village doctor who drinks too much. If you imagine that Gerald is quite happy in such a position, you are mistaken. He is thoroughly discontented. Well, he was not discontented till he met you. You have made him so. Of course I made him so. Discontent is the first step in the progress of a man or a nation. <gasps> But I did not leave him with a mere longing for things he could not get. No, I made him a charming offer. He jumped at it. Any young man would. And now, simply because it turns out that I am the boy's own father and he my own son, you propose practically to ruin his career. I will not allow him to go. You absolutely refuse? Yes. Because you have had what is called a painful past, you debar him from having a brilliant future. It comes to that. I will not allow him to go. But how can you prevent it? What excuse can you give to him for making him decline such an offer? I will not tell him in what relations I stand to him, I need hardly say. But you daren't tell him. You know that. Look how you brought him up. 
I've brought him up to be a good man. Quite so. And what is the result? You have educated him to be your judge if he ever finds you out. And a bitter judge he will be to you. Don't be deceived, Rachel. Children begin by loving their parents. After a time, they judge them. Rarely, if ever, do they forgive them. George, don't take my son away from me. I've had 20 years of sorrow. And I've only had one thing to love me, only one thing to love. You've had a life of joy, of pleasure and success. Don't come now and rob me of... of all I have in the whole world. You're so rich in other things. Leave me the little vineyard of my life. Leave me the walled-in garden and the well of water. The ewe lamb God sent me in pity or in wrath. <laughs> Leave me that, George. Don't take Gerald from me. Rachel, at the present moment, you are not necessary to Gerald's career. I am. There is no more to be said on the subject. I will not let him go. Well, he was Gerald. He has the right to decide for himself. Well, dear mother, I hope you have settled it all with Lord Illingworth. I have not, Gerald. Your mother seems not to like you coming with me for some reason. Why, mother? You know I've set my heart on going. Well, but I... I had hoped you were quite happy here with me, Gerald. I did not know you were so anxious to leave me. Dear mother, how can you talk like that? Of course I've been quite happy with you. But a man can't stay always with his mother. No chap does. I want to make myself a position to do something. I thought you would have been proud to see me Lord Illingworth's secretary. I, I, I do not think you'd be suitable to be a secretary to Lord Illingworth. You have no qualifications. I don't wish to interfere for a moment, Mrs Arbuthnot, but as far as your last objection is concerned, I surely am the best judge. Your son has all the qualifications I had hoped for. He has more, in fact, than I had even thought of. Far more. Have you some other reason, Mrs Arbuthnot, why you don't wish your son to accept this post? Have you, Mother? Do answer. If you have, pray, pray say it. We are quite by ourselves here. Whatever it is, I will not repeat it. Mother. If you would like to be alone with your son, I will leave you. You may have some other reason that you don't wish me to hear. I have no other reason. Then, my dear boy, we may look upon the matter as settled. Come, you and I will smoke a cigarette together on the terrace. And, Mrs Arbuthnot, pray, let me tell you, I think you have acted very, very wisely. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening again, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Miss Worsley, for the beautiful violin playing. It plucked at every heartstring. <laughs> Another song now, with thanks to the Temperance Society. <laughs> Ma'am? Nobody cares for me, no one would. 
would cry Even if poor little Bessie should die <laughs> Barefoot and tired I have wandered all day Asking for a work But I'm too small, they say On the damp ground I must now lay my head Father's a drunkard And mother is dead <laughs> Mother Oh, why did you leave me alone With no one to love me No friends and no home Dark is the night And the storm rages wild God pity Bessie The drunkard's lone child <laughs> We were so happy till father drank rum Then all our sorrows and troubles begun Mother grew paler and wept every day Baby and I were too hungry to play Slowly they faded and one summer night Found their dear faces all silent and white Then with big tears slowly dropping I said Father's a drunkard and mother <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very kind. Next, Dr. Daubeny will give us a taste of his forthcoming sermon on the endurance of Christianity in our modern times, <laughs> entitled Believing Where We Cannot Prove. Please do rejoin us in the drawing room for fresh lemonade, after which we will retire to the terrace. Thoroughly sensible woman, your mother. I knew she'd come round at the end. But I am so ignorant of the world, Lord Illingworth. Don't be afraid, Gerald. Remember that you've got on your side the most wonderful thing in the world. Youth. There is nothing like youth. The middle-aged are mortgaged to life. The old are in life's lumber room. But youth is the lord of life. To win back my youth, Gerald, there is nothing I wouldn't do. Except take exercise. <laughs> Get up early or be a useful member of the community. But you don't call yourself old, Lord Illingworth. I'm old enough to be your father, Gerald. I don't remember my father. He died years ago. So Lady Hunston told me. My mother never talks to me about my father. I sometimes think she must have married beneath her. <laughs> really? I fancy that they were not happy together. Or perhaps so happy that it would give her pain to talk of him. You have missed not having a father, Gerald? Oh, no. My mother has been so good to me. No one ever had such a mother. I'm quite sure of that. 
Still, I imagine that most mothers don't quite understand their sons. Don't realize, I mean, that a son has ambitions. After all, Gerald, you couldn't be expected to pass away your days in such a hole as Rockley, could you? Oh, no, it would be dreadful. A mother's love is very touching, of course, but it is often curiously selfish. I mean, there is a good deal of selfishness in it. I suppose there is. Your mother is a thoroughly good woman. But good women have such limited views of life. Their horizon is so small, isn't it? They are awfully interested, certainly, in things we don't care much about. I suppose your mother is very religious and that sort of thing. Oh, yes, she's always going to church. Ah, well, she's not modern. And to be modern is the only thing worth being nowadays. You want to be modern, don't you, Gerald? To see life as it really is? Well, all you have to do for the present is to fit yourself for the best society. And, Gerald, you should learn how to tie your tie better. A well-tied tie is the first serious step in life. In the mere knotting of a necktie or the choice of a buttonhole, there is a whole creed of life. <laughs> I might be able to learn how to tie a tie, Lord Illingworth, but I should never be able to talk as you do. <laughs> I don't know how to talk. Oh, talk to every woman as if you loved her, and every man as if he bored you. At the end of your first season, you will have the reputation for possessing the most perfect social tact. I suppose society is wonderfully delightful. Well, to be in it is merely a bore, but to be out of it is simply a tragedy. <laughs> society is a necessary thing. No man has any real success in this world unless he has got women to back him, and women rule society. If you've not got women on side, you are quite over. You might just as well be a barrister or a stockbroker or a journalist at once. It is very difficult to understand women, is it not? Excuse me, sir. Sorry. You should never try to understand them. Women are pictures. Men are problems. If you want to know what a woman really means, which, by the way, is always a dangerous thing to do, hmm. look at her. Don't listen to her. But women are awfully clever, aren't they? One should always tell them so. <laughs> but to the philosopher, my dear Gerald, women represent the triumph of matter over mind, just as men represent the triumph of mind over morals. How then can women have so much power as you say they have? The history of women is a history of the worst form of tyranny the world has ever known. The tyranny of the weak over the strong. It is the only tyranny that lasts. But there are good women in society, aren't there? Far too many. You have never been married, Lord Illingworth, have you? No. I wonder why. Men marry because they are tired. Women because they are curious. Both are disappointed. But don't you think one can be happy when one is married? Perfectly happy. But the happiness of a married man, my dear Gerald, depends upon the people he has not married. But if one is in love... One should always be in love. That is the reason one should never marry. <laughs> love is a very wonderful thing, isn't it? When one is in love, one begins by deceiving oneself, and one ends by deceiving others. A really grand passion is comparatively rare nowadays. It is the privilege of people who have nothing to do. And the only possible explanation for us Harfords... Harfords, Lord Illingworth? It's my family name. You should study the peerage, Gerald. It is the one book a young man about town should know thoroughly, and the best thing in fiction the English have ever done. <laughs> now, Gerald, you are going into a perfectly new life with me, and I want you to know how to live. For the world has been made by fools, but wise men should live in it. This way, Dr. Dovney. <laughs> we do like to complete the evening with a little... Night air. Uh, oh, here you are, Lord Illingworth. Everyone's been looking for you. Well, except Caroline has been looking for Sir John. <laughs> I suppose you've been giving our young friend Gerald here a great deal of good advice over a pleasant cigarette. The best of advice, Lady Hunston, and the best of cigarettes. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I'm sorry I was not here to listen, <laughs> but I'm too old now to oh, learn. Yes. Oh, except from you, dear Archdeacon, when you're in your nice pulpit. Oh. But I always know what you're going to say, so I never feel alarmed. Mm. <laughs>
Oh, dear Mrs. Arbuthnot, do join us. Do come, dear. Gerald has been having such a long talk with Lord Illingworth. You must feel very much flattered yeah. at the pleasant way that everything's turned out for him. Uh. Oh, <laughs> oh, let's sit down. <laughs> Please, <laughs> how is your beautiful embroidery going on? I'm always at work, Lady Hanson. Mrs. Daubney embroiders a little too, doesn't she? She was very deft with her needle. Quite a Dorcas. <laughs> but the gout has crippled her fingers a good deal. She's not touched the tambour frame for, oh, nine or ten years. But she has many other amusements. She's very much interested in her own health. <laughs> oh, oh, well, that... That is always a nice distraction, isn't it not? <laughs> now, what have you been talking about, Lord Ellingworth? Do tell us. I have the dim idea that you are always on the side of the sinners, and I know I always try to be on the side of the saints. Uh, well, the only difference between the saint and the sinner is that every saint has a past, and every sinner has a future. Oh. <laughs> oh, God. That quite does for me, I haven't a word to say. <laughs> you and I, dear Mrs. Arbuth, not behind the age. We can't follow Lord Illingworth. Too much care was taken with our education, I'm afraid. I should be sorry to follow Lord Illingworth and any of his opinions. <laughs> You're quite right, dear. Jane, have you seen John anywhere? Oh, you needn't be anxious about him, Caroline. He's with Lady Stutfield. Oh. I saw them some time ago in the yellow drawing room, and they seem quite happy together. Oh, you're not going, Caroline. Pray sit I down. I think I'd better look after John. She spoils him, dear Rector. She spoils him. Yeah. Oh, Caroline has nothing to be anxious about. Oh. Lady Stutfield is very sympathetic. She's just as sympathetic about one thing as she is about another thing. <laughs> She has a most be beautiful nature. <laughs> Comedian of Ectro de Coeur. That is what Lady Stutfield is. Oh, I delight in her. You wretch. You delight in anyone who's pretty. <laughs> <laughs> and quite right, too. <laughs> oh, here is Sir John. Oh. With Mrs. Allenby. Oh. oh. I suppose it was Mrs. Allenby I saw him with. Oh, Sir John, Caroline has been looking everywhere for you. Where have you been? Inspecting the orchids in the conservatory, Lady Hunston. Oh, God, I thought it was the yellow drawing room. My memory is getting so defective. Yeah. Mrs. Daubney has a wonderful memory, has she not? She was quite remarkable for her memory. <laughs> but since her last attack, she recalls chiefly the events of her early childhood. <laughs> and, and she has great pleasure in such retrospection. Pleasure. Oh. <laughs> oh, Lady Stutfield, what has Mr. Kevill been talking to you about? About bimetallism, as well Bi as I remember. Bimetallism? Is that quite a nice subject? <laughs> However, I know people discuss everything quite freely nowadays. <laughs> What has Sir John been talking to you about, Mrs. Allenby, over the orchids? About Patagonia. Oh, oh what a remote topic. <laughs> but very improving, I have no doubt. Oh, this has been most interesting on the subject of Patagonia. The Terra del Fuegans, it seems, hold quite the same views as ourselves on practically every subject. Oh. They're excessively advanced. What do they do? According to Sir John, almost everything. Oh. <laughs> How gratifying, dear Archdeacon, to know that human nature is permanently one. The world is simply divided into two classes. Those who believe the incredible, mm. like the public, and those who do the improbable. Like yourself? Yes, I am always astonishing myself. It's the only thing that makes life worth living. And what have you been doing lately that astonishes you? I have been discovering all kinds of beautiful qualities in my own nature. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't become quite perfect all at once. Do it gradually. Oh, I never intend to grow perfect at all. At least I hope I shan't. Be most inconvenient. Women love us for our defects. Mm. If we have enough of them, 
They will forgive us everything, even our gigantic intellects. <laughs> Oh, I think we women should forgive everything, don't you, dear Mrs. Arbuthnot? I'm sure you agree with me in that, dear. I do not, Lady Hunston. I think there are many things women should never forgive. Oh. What sort of things, dear? The ruin of another woman's life. Those things are very sad, no doubt. But I believe there are admirable homes where people of that kind are looked after. Oh, dear Lord Alfred, do find a comfortable place. I think on, I think on, I think, on the whole, the secret of life is to take things very, very easily. Mm. Oh, the secret of life is never to have an emotion that is unbecoming. Oh, the secret of life is to appreciate the pleasure of being terribly, terribly mm. deceived. The secret of life is to resist temptation, Lady Statfield. There is no secret of life. Life's aim, if it has one, is simply to be always looking for temptation. Oh, there are not nearly enough of them. I sometimes pass a whole day without coming across a single one. <laughs> oh, dear Lord Illingworth, I don't know why it is, but everything you've said today seems to me to be excessively immoral. <laughs> it's been most interesting listening to you. <laughs> All thought is immoral. Its very essence is destruction. If you think of anything, you kill it. Nothing survives being thought of. I don't understand a word, Lord Illingworth, but I'm quite sure it's all true. <laughs> Personally, I'm beginning to forget everything. It's a great misfortune. Oh. It is one of your most fascinating qualities, Lady Hunston. No woman should have a memory. Memory in a woman is the beginning of dowdiness. Oh, how charming you are, Lord Illingworth. You always find out that one's most glaring fault is one's most important virtue. Dr. Daubeny's carriage. Oh, dear Archdeacon, it's only half past ten. Well, I'm afraid I must be going, Lady Hunston. Tuesday is always one of Mrs. Daubeny's bad nights. Oh, well... Oh. I won't keep you from her. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh no. I will see you as far as the hall, dear rector. Mm. We are we are old enough friends for that. Oh, <laughs> oh I've told I've told Farker to put a brace of partridge in the carriage, oh. as Mrs. Daubeny may fancy them. That's very kind of you, but Mrs. Daubeny never touches solids now. <laughs> she lives entirely on jellies. <laughs> but she's wonderfully cheerful, wonderfully cheerful. She's nothing to complain of. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, Mrs. Arbuthnot. Oh. Starlight, star bright, and all of them most happily on account. Beautiful moon tonight. Let us go and see its reflection in the lake. To look on anything that is inconstant is charming nowadays. You have your mirror. It is unkind. It merely shows me my wrinkles. <laughs> Mine is much better behaved. It never tells me the truth. Then it is in love with you. May I come too? Do, my dear boy. John! John! Gerald! What, mother? It is getting late. Let us go home. My dear mother, do let us wait a little longer. Lord Illingworth is so delightful. And by the way, mother, I have a great surprise for you. We are starting for India at the end of this month. Let us go home. If you really want to, of course, Mother. But I must bid goodbye to Lord Illingworth first. I'll be back in five minutes. Uh. 
Let him leave me if he chooses. But not with him. Not with him. What a lovely night it is, Mrs. Arbuthnot. Is it? Mrs. Arbuthnot, I wish you would let me know you better. Your son has spoken so much of you, I seem to know you quite well. When you came in this evening, somehow you brought with you a sense of what is good and pure in life. I had been foolish. There are things that are right to say, but that may be said at the wrong time and to the wrong people. No, I heard what you said. I agree with it, Miss Worsley. I didn't know you'd heard it. But I knew you would agree with me. A woman who has sinned should be punished, shouldn't she? Yes. She shouldn't be allowed into the society of good men and women. She should not. And the man should be punished in the same way. In the same way. And the children, if there are children. In the same way also. Yes. The sins of the parents should be visited on the children. It is a just law. It is God's law. It is one of God's terrible laws. You were distressed about your son leaving you, Mrs. Arbuthnot. Yes. I know you'll miss him very much. I will miss him very much. Do you like him going away with Lord Illingworth? <gasps> Position and money are not everything, are they? No, they are nothing. They bring misery. Do you think Lord Illingworth a good man, Mrs. Arbuthnot? <laughs> Who is good in these days? None of us. Uh, but some of us try to be. Why do you let your son go away with him? He wishes it himself. But if you asked him, he would stay, would he not? Uh, he set his heart on going. Well, he couldn't refuse you anything. He loves you too much. <clears throat> Ask him to stay. Huh? Well, I think it is your duty. Let me send him to you. I can find him oh, no, for you. in trouble, Miss Wesley. I can wait. No, 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 no. I will find him and tell him you want him. Uh, do, do uh, ask him to stay. He won't come. He won't come. No tears, Rachel. No tears. No. Sir John is, is not here, Mrs. Arbuthnot, is he? No, Lady Caroline. Oh, Mr. Arbuthnot, have you seen Sir John anywhere? No, Lady Caroline. This is very curious. It is time for him to retire. Dear Mother, I'm afraid I kept you waiting. I forgot all about it. I am so happy tonight, Mother. I've never been so happy. At the prospect of going away. Don't put it like that, Mother. Of course I'm sorry to leave you. But as Lord Illingworth says, it is impossible to live in such a place as Rockley. You don't mind it, but I'm ambitious. I want something more than that. Well, don't go away with Lord Illingworth. I implore you not to. Don't. I beg you Mother, not Mother, how changeable you are. An hour and a half ago in the drawing room, you agreed to the whole thing. Now you turn round and make objections. It is very strange that when I've had such a wonderful piece of good luck, the one person to put difficulties in my way should be my own mother. Shh, shh. Besides, you know, Mother, I love Hester Worsley. I love her. More than I've ever told you. More than I can ever tell her. Far more. And if I had a position, if I had prospects, I could... I could ask her to... If I were Lord Illingworth's secretary, I could ask Hester to be my wife. I fear you need have no hopes of Miss Worsley. You have always tried to crush my ambition, Mother, haven't you? You've told me the world is a wicked place, that success is not worth having, that society is shallow. Well, I don't believe it, Mother. I think the world must be delightful. I think society must be exquisite. You've been wrong in all that you taught me, Mother, quite wrong. 
Lord Illingworth is a successful man, a fashionable man. Well, I would give anything to be just like Lord Illingworth. Oh, God. I would sooner see you dead. Mother! What is your objection to Lord Illingworth? Tell me, tell me right out, what I is it? He is a bad man. In what way bad? I don't understand. I will tell you. You think him bad because he doesn't believe the same things as you do. He doesn't believe all the old conventionalities one has been taught about. I, he is perfectly right. It is not what Lord Illingworth believes or does not believe that makes him bad. It is what he is. Is it something you know of him? Something you actually yes, know? Yes, it is something I know. Something you're quite sure of? Quite sure How of. How long have you known it? For 20 years. Is it fair to go back 20 years in any man's career? You have always told me it is unfair to judge people on their pasts. A and what have you or I to do with Lord Illingworth's early life? What business is it of ours? Gerald, what this man has been, he is now and will be always. Mother, tell me what Lord Illingworth did. If he did anything shameful, I will not go away with him. Gerald, come near to me. Come. Quite close, as you used to when you were a little boy. When you were mother's own boy. Gerald. There was a girl once. She was very young. She was a little over 18 at the time. George Harford met her. She knew nothing about life. He knew everything. He made this girl love him. He made her love him so much that she left her father's house with him one morning. She stayed with him for a year abroad. She loved him so much and he'd promised to marry her. He'd solemnly promised and she believed him. She was very young and ignorant of what life really is. But he put the marriage off from week to week, from month to month. She trusted in him all the while. She loved him. Before her child was born, for she had a child, she implored him for the child's sake to marry, that the child might have a name, that her sin might not be visited on the child who was innocent. He refused. After the child was born, she left him, taking the child away. And her life was ruined. And her soul ruined. And all that was sweet and pure and good in her, ruined also. She suffered terribly. She suffers now. She'll always suffer. For her, there's no at atonement. She drags a chain like a guilty thing. She wears a mask like a thing that is a leper. The fire cannot purify her, the waters cannot quench, nothing can heal her, no anodyne can give her sleep, no poppy's forgetfulness, a lost soul. That is why I call Lord Illingworth a bad man. That is why I do not want my boy to be with him. My dear mother, it all sounds very tragic, of course, but I dare say the girl was just as much to blame as Lord Illingworth was. After all, would a really nice girl, a girl with any nice feelings at all, go away from her home with a man to whom she was not married and live with him as his wife. No nice girl would. Gerald, I withdraw all my objections. You're at liberty to go away with Lord Illingworth when and where you choose. Dear mother, I knew you wouldn't stand in my way. You are the best woman God ever made. And as for Lord Illingworth, I don't believe he is capable of anything infamous or base. I can't believe it of him. I can't. Let me go. What is that? Save me! What? Save me from him! 
From whom? He has insulted me horribly, insulted who? me, saved me. Who's dead? Lord Illingworth! You've insulted the purest thing on God's earth, a thing as pure as my own mother. You've insulted the woman I love as I love my mother. Dear boy. You are infamous, foul, polluted. As there is a God in heaven, I will kill you. No, no. Don't hold me, mother. Don't hold me. I'll kill him. Gerald, let me go, I say. Don't hold me. Stop, Gerald. Stop. He is. Rachel, I'll don't kill him. He is your own father. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Before a fresh walk across the gardens, a cautionary tale. Trust him not. Do not turn so coldly from me. I would only guard thy youth from his stern and withering power. I would only tell thee truth. I would shield thee from all danger. Save thee from the tempter's snare. Lady, shun that dark-eyed stranger. I have warned thee, now beware. Lady, shun that dark-eyed stranger. I have warned thee, now beware. <laughs> And like thee fair, and he wooed and wooed and won her, filled her gentle heart with care. Then he heeded not her weeping, nor cared he her life to save. Soon she perished, now she's sleeping in a cold and silent grave. Soon she perished, now she's sleeping in a cold and silent grave. Keep thy gold, I do not wish it. Lady, I have prayed for this, for the hour when I might foil him, rob him of expected bliss. Gentle lady, do not wonder at my words so cold and wild. Lady, in that green grave yonder lies the gypsy's only child. Lady, in that green grave yonder lies the gypsy's only child. And How do you do? Come to inquire for Mrs. Arbuthnot, if she's available. Of course, right this way. Thank you. 
Lady Hunston and Mrs. Allenby. Good morning, Gerald. Good morning, Lady Hunston. Good morning, Mrs. Allenby. Good morning, Mr. Arbuthnot. Ooh. How serious you look. We've come to inquire for your dear mother, Gerald. I do hope she's better. My mother has not come down yet, Lady Hunston. Oh, I'm afraid the heat was too much for her last night. It felt like thunder in the air. Or perhaps it was the, the music. Music makes one feel so romantic. <laughs> Well, at least it always gets on one's nerves. <laughs> <laughs> the same thing nowadays. I can't make out what happened to everyone last night. My pretty little American disappeared to bed without bidding me good night. Lord Illingworth never went to the smoking room. And Lady Caroline sent me a note by her maid this morning to say that her poodle had had a severe attack of indigestion. Mm. And Sir John had been obliged to sit up with it till four in the morning. Oh, I see you're examining Mrs. Arbuthnot's pretty room. Isn't it nice and old-fashioned? <laughs> Quite the happy English home. It's just the word, dear. That just describes it. One feels your mother's good influence in everything, Gerald. I should like to see Lord Illingworth in a happy English home. <laughs> it would do him a great deal of good, dear. Here we have the room of a sweet saint. And what nice books your mother has, Gerald. Ooh, all written by archdeacons and colonial bishops. <laughs> that makes one feel so safe, doesn't it? <laughs> and fresh natural flowers and pictures one can look at without blushing. <laughs> but I like blushing. Well, there is a great deal to be said for blushing, if one can do it at the proper moment. <laughs> Poor dear Hunston used to tell me I didn't blush nearly often enough, but he was so very particular. He didn't introduce me to one of his female friends, and as for his men friends, he would only let me know those who were over 70. <laughs> <laughs> I delight in men over 70. They always offer one the devotion of a lifetime. She's quite incorrigible, Gerald, isn't she? And by the by, Gerald, I do hope your dear mother will come and see me more often now. You and Lord Illingworth start almost immediately, don't you? I have given up my intention of being Lord Illingworth's secretary. Oh, surely not, Gerald. That would be most unwise of you. I don't think I should be suitable for the post. I wish Lord Illingworth would ask me to be his secretary. Oh, really, dear? You mustn't talk like that in this house. Really, Joe, what do you mean by not being suitable? Why, to be a private secretary nowadays, you don't need to know anything. <laughs> you needn't even know how to spell. My son James could be a private secretary, and his spelling is the most daring thing possible. The amount of letters James gets into a word is quite extraordinary. <laughs> He says it's not good form to spell well. Lord Illingworth's views of life and mine are too different. Oh, now, Gerald, at your age you shouldn't have any views of life. You need to be guided by others in this matter. Lord Illingworth has made you the most flattering offer. Travelling with him, you would see the world. Well, at least as much of it as one should look at. Under the best auspices possible. I don't want to see the world. I've seen enough of it. I hope you don't think you've exhausted life, Mr. Arbuthnot. When a man says that, one knows that life has exhausted him. I don't wish to leave my mother. Oh, now, Gerald, that is pure laziness on your part. <laughs> really? You young men of the present day, you have no ambition at all. It all goes in cigarettes, I believe. Not leave your mother. If I was your mother, I would insist on you going. Mrs. Arbuthnot's compliments, my lady, but she has a bad headache and cannot see anyone this morning. A bad headache? How very interesting. I had a bad headache myself lately. I forget when it was. I cured it at once with the most wonderful medicine. I can't remember its name, but your dear mother should use it, Gerald. You'll tell her, won't you? and you'll bring her to Hunston this afternoon, if she's better. I'm afraid not this afternoon, Lady Hunston. Well, tomorrow, then. If you had a father, Gerald, he wouldn't let you waste your life here. But mothers are so weak. 
We give up to our sons in everything. We are all heart, all heart. Come, dear, I must call at the rectory and inquire for Mrs. Daubney, who I'm afraid is far from well. It is wonderful how the archdeacon bears up, quite wonderful. He's the most sympathetic of husbands, quite a, a model. Mm. Goodbye, Gerald. Give my fondest love to your mother. Goodbye, Mr. Arbuthnot. Are you afraid of Lord Illingworth, that you refuse such an offer? I am not afraid of anyone, Mrs. Allenby. Oh, I'm afraid of him. That's why I like him so much. Oh, come, dear. You mustn't flirt with Mr. Arbuthnot. He is in my black books. Goodbye. Goodbye. What name can I sign? I who have no right to any name. Goodbye again, Gerald. We're going to take the shortcut across your pretty garden. And remember my advice. Start at once with Lord Illingworth. Au revoir, Mr. Arbuthnot. Mind you, bring me back something nice from your travels. Mother, I have just written to him. To whom? To my father. I have written to tell him to come here at four o'clock this afternoon. He shall not come here. Huh. He shall not cross the threshold of my house. He must go, come. If you're going away with Lord Illingworth, go at once. Go before it kills me, but don't ask me to meet him. Mother, you don't understand. Nothing in the world would induce me to go away with Lord Illingworth. Huh. No, I have written to him to say. Oh, what can you have to say to him? Can't you guess, Mother, what I have written in this letter? No. Mother, surely you can. Think, think what must be done now at once. There is nothing to be done. I have written to Lord Illingworth to tell him that he must marry you. <laughs> <laughs> Marry me! Mother, the wrong that has been done you must be repaired. Atonement must be made. But In a few days you shall be Lord Illingworth's lawful wife. I will insist upon his doing it. He will not dare to refuse. But Gerald, it is I who refuse. I will not marry Lord Illingworth. Not marry him, Mother. I will not marry him. But you don't understand. It is for your sake I am talking, not for mine. This marriage, this necessary marriage, will not help me. But surely it will be something for you. That you, my mother, should, however late, become the wife of the man who is my father. Will not that be something? I will not marry him. Mother, you must. I will not. What atonement can be made to me? There is no atonement possible. I am disgraced, he is not, that is all. It is the usual history of a man and a woman as it always happens. And the ending is the ordinary ending. The woman suffers, the man goes free. Your life, mother, shall not end like that. The man shall make whatever reparation is possible. Oh. It is not enough. It does not wipe out the past. I know that. But at least it makes the future better. Better for you, mother. I refuse to marry Lord Illingworth. I'd rather lie in the grave than be George Harford's wife. Mother, it is to take away the bitterness out of your life, to take away the shadow that lies on your name, that this marriage must take place. Oh. It is a duty that you owe, not merely to yourself, but to all other women. I owe nothing to other women. There is not one of them to help me. There is not one woman in the world to whom I could go for pity if I would take it. That girl last night, good though she is, fled from the room as though I were a tainted thing. And she was right, I am a tainted thing. But my wrongs are my own and I will bear them alone. What have women who have not sinned to do with me or I with them? We do not understand each other. Mother, don't say that. Why should I not? It is true. It is not, and I implore you to do what I ask you. I will not do it! Don't turn away from me, Mother. Listen. Oh. It is only right you should listen, Mother. Surely your religion, the religion that you taught me when I was a boy, Mother, must tell you that I am right. You know it. You feel it. I do not know it. I do not feel it. Nor will I ever stand before God's altar and ask God's blessing on so hideous a mockery as a marriage between me and George Harford. I will not say the words the church bids us to say. I will not say them. No. Marriage is a sacrament for those who love each other. It is not for such as him or such as me. Gerald. To save you from the world's Sneers and taunts, I've lied to the world. For 20 years, I've lied to the world. I could not tell the world the truth. Who can ever? But not for my own sake will I lie to God, 
And in God's presence, no, Gerald, no ceremony, church hallowed or state made shall ever bind me to George Harford. It may be that I'm too much bound to him already. I don't understand you now. Men don't understand what mothers are. To bear you, I had to look on death. To nurture you, I had to wrestle with it. Death fought with me for you. All women have to fight with death to keep their children. Death, being childless, wants our children from us. Gerald, when you were naked, I clothed you. When you were hungry, I gave you food. When you were cold, I warmed you. If you were sleepless, I walked with you all night long in my arms. If you were fretful, I made songs to soothe you. Night and day, I tended you. No office is too mean, no care too lowly for the thing we women love. And oh, how I loved you. Not Hannah, Samuel Moore. And you needed love, for you were weakly, and only love could have kept you alive. Only love can keep anyone alive. And then you began to grow up. You grew stronger, much stronger, and ran about and wanted playmates. And I, I felt you'd be happier at school than at home, so I sent you to school and was glad when you wrote me a blotted boyish scrawl once in a term. You made many friends and went into their houses and were glad with them, and I, knowing my secret, did not dare to follow, but stayed at home, closed the door, shut out the sun. What should I have done in honest households? My past was ever with me, and you thought I didn't care for the pleasant things of life. I tell you, I longed for them. But did not dare to touch them feeling I had no right. You thought I was happier working amongst the poor. That was my mission. You imagined it was not, but where else was I to go? The sick do not ask if the hand that smooths their pillow is pure, nor the dying care if the lips that touch their brow have known the kiss of sin. It was you I thought of all the time. I gave to them the love you did not need. You thought I spent too much of my time going to church and in church duties, but where else could I turn? God's house is the only house where sinners are made welcome. And you were always in my heart, Gerald, too much in my heart. Although day after day, at morn or evensong, I have knelt in God's house, I have never repented of my sin. How could I, when you, my love, for its fruit? You are more to me than innocence. I would rather be your mother, much rather, than have always been pure. Don't you see? Don't you understand? It's my dishonor that's made you so dear to me. It's my disgrace that has bound you so closely to me. It's, it's the price I paid for you. The price of soul and body that makes me love you as I do. Don't ask me to do this horrible thing child of my shame. Be still the child of my shame. Mother, I didn't know you loved me so much as that. I will be a better son to you than I have been. I have no one to love me but you, mother. I, I suppose I never did. You and I must never leave each other. But mother, I can't help it. You must become my father's wife. You no. must marry him. It no. is your duty. No, no. Hester. No, you shall not. Hester. Oh. That would be real dishonor. The first Hester. you have ever known, real disgrace. The first to touch you. Leave him and 
Oh, come with me. But there are other countries than England with its evil society. A better, a wiser, and less unjust land. The world is wide. No, not for me. For me, the world is shriveled to a palm's breadth. It shall not be so. Where I walk, there are thorns. Oh, we shall find oh, green valleys and fresh waters. If we weep, well, we shall weep together. Esther. But don't. Don't. You cannot love me at all unless you love her also. You cannot honor me unless she is holier to you. Hester, Hester, what shall I do? Do you respect the man who's your father? Respect him? I despise him. Tell me what to do now. Ask your own heart, and not mine. I never had a mother to save or shame. He is hard. He is hard. Let me go away. Mother, forgive me. I have been to blame. Oh, don't kiss my hands. They're cold. My heart is cold. But don't say Something that. Broken Our it. hearts live by being wounded. The pleasure may turn a heart to stone. Riches may make it callous, but sorrow, sorrow cannot break it. But besides, and what sorrows have you now? Why, at this moment, you are more dear to him than ever. Be kind to him. You are my mother and my father, all in one. I need no second parent. Oh, say something, mother. Have I but found one love to lose another? Has he found indeed another love? I have loved him always. But we are very poor, poorer than Gerald knows. Who being loved is poor? No one. I hate my riches. They are a burden. Let him share it with but me. But we're disgraced. We rank amongst the outcasts. Gerald is nameless. The sins of the parents should be visited on the children. It is God's law. I was wrong. It is God's law. God's law is only love. Gerald. Gerald! <laughs> Gerald. I cannot give you a father, but I have brought you a wife. I am not worthy either of her or you. So she comes first, you are worthy. And when you're away, Gerald, with her, think of me sometimes. Hmm? Don't forget me. You will be happy, Gerald. You don't think of leaving us. You will come with us. Mother, you won't leave I us. I might bring shame upon you. Mother. Oh, be with us. Be with us. Mother. Oh, for a little then. And if you'd let me near you, always. Now, leave me. The roses in our garden are in bloom and have no thorns. Come out to the garden. Later on. Later on. A gentleman to see you, ma'am. Oh, say I'm not at home. Show me the card. Say I will not see him. Leave us. Don't you hear me? That'll do, Alice. Well, what can you have to say to me today, George Harford? You must leave this house. Rachel. My son may come in at any moment. I saved you last night. I may not be able to save you again. My son feels my dishonor strongly, terribly strongly. I beg you to go. Last night was excessively unfortunate. That silly Puritan girl making a scene merely because I wanted to kiss her. What harm is there in a kiss? A kiss may ruin a human life, George Harford. I know that. I know that too well. We won't discuss that at present. What is of importance today, as yesterday, is still our son. I'm extremely fond of Gerald. More fond than I ever thought I should be of anybody or anything. Odd though it may seem to you, 
I admired his conduct last night immensely. He took up the cudgels for that pretty prude with wonderful promptitude. He is just what I should have wanted a son of mine to be. Now, what I propose is this. Lord Illingworth, no proposition of yours interests me. According to our ridiculous English laws, I can't legitimise Gerald, but I can leave him my property. What more can a gentleman require in this world? Nothing more, I'm quite sure. As for a title, a title is really rather a nuisance in these democratic days. Well, my proposal is this. I told you I was not interested and I beg you to go. The boy is to be with you for six months in the year and with me for the other six. That is perfectly fair, is it not? You may have what allowance you wish and live where you choose. And you needn't be afraid that Gerald won't be my heir. I have not the slightest intention of marrying. You come too late. My son has no need of you. You are not necessary. What do you mean, Rachel? You are not necessary to Gerald's career. He does not require you. I do not understand you. Look into the garden. You better not let them see you. You bring unpleasant memories. She loves him. They love each other. We are safe from you and we're going away. Where? We will not tell you and if you find us, we will not know you. <laughs> you seem surprised. What welcome would you get from the girl whose lips you tried to soil? From the boy whose life you've shamed, from the mother whose dishonour comes from you. You have grown hard, Rachel. Well, I was too weak once. It is well for me that I have changed. I was very young at the time. We men know life too early. And we women know life too late. Hmm. Rachel. My son's never smoked in this room. No matter. Do you not better go, Lord Hillingworth? Rachel, I want my son. My money may be of no use to him now, I may be of no use to him now, but I want my son. Bring us together, Rachel. You can do it if you choose. There is no room in my boy's life for you. He is not interested in you. Then why does he write to me? What do you mean? What letter is this? Oh, th that's nothing. Um, give it to me. It is addressed to me. You're not to open it. I forbid you to open it. And in Gerald's handwriting, it's something too. he wrote to you this morning before he saw me, but he's sorry now. He wrote it. Very sorry. You're not to open it. Give it to me. It belongs to me. Um... You have read this letter, I suppose, Rachel? No. You know what is in it? Yes. I don't admit for a moment that the boy is right. I don't admit that it is any duty of mine to marry you. I deny it entirely. But to get back my son, I am ready. Yes. I am ready to marry you and treat you always with the deference and respect due to my wife. I will marry you as soon as you choose. I give you my word of honour. You made that promise to me once before and broke it. I will keep it now. And that will show you that I love my son. At least as much as you love him. For when I marry you, Rachel, there are some ambitions I shall have to surrender. High ambitions too, if any ambition be high. So you again propose to marry me? I do. I decline to marry you, Lord Illingworth. You decline? <laughs> I refuse. Are you serious? <sighs> yes. <sighs> Do tell me your reasons. They would interest me enormously. <sighs> I've already explained them to my son. Well, I suppose they were intensely sentimental, weren't they? You women live by your emotions and for them. You have no philosophy of life. You are right. We women live by our emotions and for them, by our passions and for them, if you will. I have two passions, Lord Illingworth. Oh. My love of him and my hate of you. You cannot kill those. They feed each other. What kind of love is that which needs to have hate as its brother? The sort of love I have for Gerald. Do you think that terrible? 
Well, it is terrible. All love is terrible. All love is a tragedy. I loved you once, Lord Illingworth. What a tragedy for a woman to have loved you. So you really refuse to marry me? <laughs> yes. Because you hate me? Yes. And does my son hate me as you do? No. Oh, I'm glad of it, Rachel. He merely despises you. <laughs> what a pity. What a pity for him, I mean. Don't be deceived, George. Children begin by loving their parents. After a time, they judge them. Rarely, if ever, do they forgive them. May I ask? by what arguments you made the boy who wrote this letter, this beautiful, passionate letter, believe that you should not marry his father, the father of your own child. It was not I that made him see it, it was another. Oh, what fantasiacal person! The Puritan, Lord Illingworth. There is not then much for me to do here. Rachel? Nothing. It is goodbye, is it? Forever, I hope, this time. Lord Illingworth. How curious. This moment, you look exactly as you looked the night you left me, 20 years ago. You have just the same expression in your mouth. Upon my word, Rachel, no woman ever loved me as you did. You gave yourself to me like a flower do anything I liked with. You were to love me forever, weren't you? Till the boy came. You were the prettiest of playthings. The most fascinating of small romances. Pity the boy came, wasn't it? Quarter to two. Must be strolling back to Hunston. Don't suppose I shall see you there again. I'm sorry. I am, really. It's been an amusing experience to meet amongst people of one's own rank and treated quite seriously too. One's mistress and one's You are the woman I did the honour of asking to be my wife. How foolish the wisest of us are at times. But one day your son may call you by a worse name. He has my blood in his veins as well as yours. He would have said it. You would have said it. Well, dear mother, you never came out after all, so we'd come in to fetch you. Mother, you've not been crying. Oh, my boy, my boy, my boy. But you have two children now. <laughs> You'll let me be your daughter. Would you choose me for a mother? You, of all women I have ever known. Dear child, I owe you everything. You owe me nothing. For there are things so far away we cannot see their use, so near we cannot see their beauty. And you have shown them to me. But we will not talk of what is over. Now for us, life is just beginning. We will find a new life in a new land and be so happy. Happiness. What's that in store for me? So much. Come, the sun is brighter than ever. Let us go out and bid goodbye to the old garden. My daughter. My daughter. Hello, mother. Whose glove is this? You've had a visitor. Who was it? Oh, 
No one. No one in particular. A man of no importance. 